And he has paid the highest price And he has proven his great love for us And we will praise him with our lives you don't know me, my name's Tony, I'm one of the pastors here And this is going to be interesting Trying to look around at everybody. Um, I like the setup. It's great. We can see who's coming in late. <laughs> no, just kidding. Um, but yeah, it's different. It's a little bit different, isn't it? Take us a little bit out of our comfort zone, but it's good. So uh, there are some sheets at the back on the table by the, by the back door there if you'd like to take some notes. So feel, welcome, feel free to jump up and pick up some of those. Um, today I'm going to be talking on, uh, continuing our talk on rethinking evangelism, and um, I just want to say what a, what a pleasure it is to be part of the, the baptisms this morning, some fantastic words spoken, and um, kind of just could almost leave it there, rather than having another white Baptist man stand up and speak, <laughs> as Dan said, but I'm not quite 50 yet, so <laughs> it's okay. Um, yeah, so it's, it's right to rejoice. It's right to rejoice with people who are getting baptised as a church. And um, they, both uh, Janelle and Emma are responding to God. It's an act of obedience, as, as Barry said, an act of obedience. It's a commitment that, that flows out of their love for God and what he's done for them through Christ. Um, so... I'm going to continue a little bit of that theme today of acting out of obedience and acting out of our love for God, um, doing something active for Him. And through this series that we've been having, the hope is that many of you will have had your perception of the word evangelism uh, adjusted or changed or reshaped somehow so that the practice of sharing your faith becomes a little less daunting and a little more doable. Um, And so uh, this morning we're going to be looking at, just to coincide with those baptisms, we're going to be looking at follow-up, follow-up for new believers. How do we actively support people who are exploring their faith? How do we, what are some practical steps that we as Christians Christians can do to to disciple others? So in a moment I'm going to show another of Dave Mahon's videos, and um, this one's entitled Follow-up Principles for Success. But I've titled today's sermon, Follow-Up Principles for Discipleship. And the reason I've done that is because the word success has, uh, alone, on its own, has so many negative connotations, I think, in today's world, because it means, um, in our society, it means being inwardly focused and and being a little bit selfish and just getting the things that you want. Um, But discipleship has different connotations. It has... Uh, connotations that help us to understand that as a believer, our life isn't about us. It's really, actually, much of it is about what we can give. And part of that giving involves giving our time and our energy to share our faith and to disciple new believers. We're to help them grow in Christ. And in that process, we grow too. So it's a win-win situation. Um, But there is an aspect of that principle of losing our life to find it. And um, here we go. It's working now. It's good. It wasn't working this morning. Um, In Matthew 10.39, it says, whoever finds their life will lose it, and whoever loses their life, for my sake, will find it. Whoever finds their life will lose it, and whoever loses their life, for my sake, will find it. And that principle is so important that you'll find it in four, four, all four Gospels, and you'll find it twice in Matthew as well. Um, so an important scripture to keep in mind. Second is, we know there's a clear command in scripture given by Jesus to his followers to go and make disciples, and that's in Matthew 28, 18 to 20. If you have your Bibles with you, you might like to turn to that with me. Matthew 28, 18 to 20. Matthew 28, 18 to 20 says, Then Jesus came to to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. 
Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So these sermons we've been doing on evangelism have been very practical, not so exegetical, but I just want to take a moment to look at that verse. Um, there are three important things in those verses. Firstly, as followers of Jesus, this commission to make disciples applies to all of us. Yeah, you may have heard it said some people think that he was just speaking to the disciples at the time, but this applies to all of us because we are all followers of Jesus. Secondly, it points out that we do it under his authority. We might make disciples under his authority. And thirdly, he is with us as we go about doing it. So those are, those are encouraging words, knowing that we have his authority and that he is with us as we make disciples. Also, let's have a look at John 13, 34 to 35. Uh, if you have your Bibles, you can turn to that too. John 13, 34 and 35 says, A new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. So you must, sorry, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. It's a telling verse, isn't it? By this everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. I've been wondering what that kind of love amongst believers looks like. I think it could manifest itself in, in lots of different ways. It could be how we share our resources, how we help each other through illness, uh, how, we, how we serve one another. But I also think that when we share our faith and when we disciple others, it's a, that's a very powerful act of love also. In fact, I believe that all of those ways of showing love to each other are wrapped up in that culture of discipleship. Imagine, if, imagine that if everybody knew we were followers of Jesus because they see us working with another, one another and discipling one another and walking alongside one another and showing that, that love consistently. What would it be like if, if everybody in the church took time to mentor and guide new believers? if we were all willing to get alongside them and walk with them in their faith. Unfortunately, it doesn't always happen. And sometimes, new believers, they fall through the, the gaps, they fall through the cracks. But I'm not laying blame, although there does seem to be a problem in, in, in churches in New Zealand. They're not thriving the way we would like them to. There isn't that growth we'd like to see that quite often there are, there are new believers who fall away shortly after they come to Christ. We're in a real war for people's souls. We're in a war for their salvation. It's, it's a real war that we, we don't always see. And New Zealand is becoming more and more secular. The Christian faith either seems irrelevant or is undesirable to most New Zealanders. So we shouldn't be surprised that it's tough going, right? But we should also not be surprised that we aren't seeing change if we aren't changing what we're doing. Um, Bill Wilson, who is the founder of Metro Ministries in Brooklyn, where I worked, was very fond of saying, if you want something you've never had before, if you want something you've never had, you must be willing to do something you've never done before. And he said it a lot. <laughs> uh, and it seems simple, it seems like, well, of course, but do we really recognise that? and Do we put it into practice? Um, here are some pictures of me in Brooklyn. Uh, it's, a, it's a picture of a picture, so I'm sorry about the quality. I had my laptop nicked when I, when I came back from America, so I lost the photos. But um, there's some pictures of me doing things I'd never done before. And uh, 
On one of them, I'm dressed up in some sort of bunny costume, throwing, throwing a gridiron, throwing a ball for the kids. Um, another, another one, I'm, I'm getting makeup put on my face, and others, I'm leading a dance and song. And this was all ministry that we did out on the streets uh, to the kids in the projects in Brooklyn. And it involved a lot of doing stuff that you had never done before. But I got to see things I'd never seen before, and I got to see results that I hadn't seen before. General Norman Schwarzkopf of the U.S. Army said something very similar to Bill Wilson. He said, the truth of the matter is you always know the right thing to do. The hard part is doing it. So what can we start doing if we're not doing it already? What steps can we take to disciple others in our own context here in New Zealand? Well, let's have a look at what Dave Mann has to say in the following video. The Great Commission of Matthew 28 instructs us to make disciples of people from all nations. Now this in Matthew 28 includes two different things. I would say there's firstly the sharing of the gospel to which a person might respond. And this is what baptism is symbolic of. But also, we need to help that person to get grounded in their newfound faith, knowing Jesus' teachings, but also obeying them. When we're active in sharing our faith, sooner or later, we're going to need to become active in discipleship of a new believer. So what is follow-up and how can we do it? Follow-up is a continued conversation with a content. It's not all that different to our evangelistic approach that we've been encouraging, which is about a conversation with a person with a gospel content in mind. All that's different is the content, which now is regarding what it is to have a relationship with a God we can't see and how that relationship affects our relationships with people in the church and people out of the church. Here are a few important tips. Number one, make new believers a priority for your time. If someone expresses an interest or makes a response, talk to them immediately. Get to know them a little. Arrange to meet them again a day or two later. And if you miss that opportunity, we'll give them a phone call within 24 hours. Again, taking an interest and encouraging them, but trying to meet with them so you could talk about things a bit more. This is so important because a new believer really is a bit like a baby. It's not to say they're immature as a human being, but it's to say they don't know much about faith, maybe, and they don't know God very well. It's easy for them to become discouraged or to become distracted by the worries of this life or the deceitfulness of wealth or by other things which the scriptures warn us about. We do well to take note of this. I'll add a further comment that it could be wise if we were to expand our horizons and no longer limit our follow-up only to those who have made a decision to follow Jesus. You see, what about the skeptic who has become a seeker? What about we begin to follow up with everyone who expresses an interest in learning more? You see, a lot of people are seeking God. They have a heart that is after spiritual things. They just haven't heard good reasons for believing the Christian faith. And so it's because they're people of integrity, they're men and women of integrity, that they don't follow the Christian faith because they haven't heard those reasons. So broadening the scope of our follow-up efforts to include interested people as well as those who respond, it could prove beneficial. Number two, use existing relationships because follow-up is about a continued conversation. If a person's come to faith at an event or a church service, the first question is, who invited them? Because that person will have the best chances of engaging a continued conversation. Now, if they came by themselves, the next best person would be any person who talked with them or the person who had prayed with them. And failing that, you simply make the best of it and give them a phone call. It is a time-tested pattern that people are more likely to have a continued conversation uh, with a person they've got a relationship with than they are to start a conversation with someone new. It's a natural human dynamic. I think we can all understand it. In terms of helping them learn a few more things about getting to know what God is like, number three, invite people to things that they are ready for. And this is, again, no different to how it is in our Christian witness. One pattern isn't going to fit everyone, so we need to be flexible. Some people will be ready to visit a church. Others will feel more at home in an Alpha or Journeys or Christianity Explored course. And other people, well, it might just have to be a relaxed relational approach around a coffee or 
in a kitchen or in a cafe. Lastly, what content do you discuss when you're meeting with a new believer uh, in a cafe or in your home? First of all, what does it mean to have a relationship with a God that you cannot see? So what is salvation? And then we talk to God through prayer and he talks to us through his word. Secondly, how does that relationship with God affect your relationship with other believers? Well, we've become brothers and sisters in Christ. And we meet in large groups to hear teaching and do things together. We meet in small groups to have fellowship and encourage one another. And how does that relationship with God affect our relationship with the world? Well, God's given us gifts and abilities for a reason. And so we each have a ministry in the world using what he's given us. But we also have a mission in the world to encourage others toward faith in the same way others have previously encouraged us toward faith in Christ. Well, I edited about four minutes out of that video for the sake of time. So I do encourage you to go to the altogether.co.nz um, website to have a look at those videos, those equipping videos. They're very good. And um, you could go over that again uh, on your own. <coughs> so what did, what did he say? We'll just review those, those uh, three first points at the start of the video briefly. He said, Make new believers a priority for your time. When I, was, uh, when I first became a new believer and was given a revelation of Christ, I was kind of switching between the, this walking in this new life with Christ and going back to the old life that I'd known because obviously I was under a lot of spiritual attack. I didn't realize that at the time. But also I thought I just was just thinking, well, it'd just be easier to live for myself and carry on doing the things I know and doing the things I do. But the, the two men who had introduced me to Jesus, uh, their names were Mike and Peter, they made a, a real effort to make me a priority. They really stuck with me through that time. And I'm so thankful because if, if they hadn't, I don't know where I, I would have been now. I don't know w what decision I would have made. The second point he made was use existing relationships. Now, Mike and Peter, they, they didn't know me that well, but they knew that I wasn't I hadn't grown up in a church. They knew I wasn't part of a Christian community. So what they did was, uh, out of our existing relationship, they invited me to their homes. And they invited me to, to look at the Bible together and, and talk through some things together. And um, they, they really allowed me to see their faith lived out and what it meant for them. So that, that, that existing relationship was something they made use of, which was, I, I was also very thankful for. And number three, Dave said, invite people to things they are ready for. Um, Peter and Mike, they didn't actually invite me to church. I think that was partly because they, they knew I'd get a little bit freaked out if I went to church. I'd, I'd never gone to church for any other reason other than a funeral or a, or a wedding. Um, but what they did do is they invited me into their homes. So they invited me to, to something that I was ready to be invited into. Um, and so what I found at that time was that that was more personal and more relational for me than, than perhaps being invited into a church would have been, and they understood that. But I did eventually get invited into church later on by, by someone I knew, and, and um, she lived in the same area as me, and, and th at that point I was ready to try it out. So, um, and I'm glad I went because I had a real, a very, very powerful encounter with God and um, I'm thankful that she invited me there also. <clears throat> so, I want to move on um, to just look at a couple of things to finish up. Actually, I don't want to quite go to that just yet. Um, I just want to remind us that we, this morning we rejoiced with those who were being baptised. We, we, we recognised that each one of them was responding to God by taking quite a brave step, quite an important step of being baptised. But the question I want to put to you today is, what is our active response to God right now as followers who are commissioned to make disciples? What brave steps are we taking? What are the really practical things that we can do in our church, in our community, that will give us reason to rejoice as well. And before we look at those things, I just want to ask you to take a look at this can I have here. And 
imagine that it represents a person. And for today, imagine that it represents a new believer in Christ. What can you tell me about this can? What qualities does it have? <laughs> Anyone? It'd just be obvious, I suppose, something. It's clean and shiny, well, yeah. That might have something to do with a new believer, I don't know, hopefully. It's a bit of a mystery. We don't know what's inside. So I've taken the label off and we don't know what's inside that can. Right? But it's easy with a can. We can find out what's inside. We can just open it up. Which I'm not going to do because things might get a little bit messy. It's not, it's not so easy to know what's inside a person. People often assume what another person is like by seeing them from the outside. And even as brothers and sisters in Christ, we often only know how to look on the outside. We need to train ourselves to get to know what's on the inside. The only way we can really help and disciple someone is if we get to know them and find out what's on the inside. And that's, what, that's the heart of what Dave Mann has been talking about uh, in each of his videos as he promotes this, this conversational approach. That approach emphasizes the need to genuinely relate to others. Okay, so what are three practical ways we can really get to know people on the inside and be active in our discipleship in the church and our community? The first one is introduce. Introduce yourself to people you haven't met. Uh, introduce yourself, introduce people to each other if you know that they have something in common. But if introducing yourself to others is uncomfortable for you, you might want to get involved in serving at the church where introductions just happen naturally, uh, where you meet people naturally. Introductions are the place where relationships can begin. The second is invite. Invite people into conversations after church services and in the cafe. Invite others into your home. Invite people to join you in activities or hobbies because invitations foster relationships. It's a little bit, uh, in the society that we're in today, where things are quite individualistic and people become very sort of set in their ways, this doesn't seem to happen so often nowadays. But we can change that. We can do something different as a church community. The third is invest. Invest your time and your knowledge and your skills into others. Let them know they matter. Let them know that you're willing to walk alongside them and help them in their faith journey. So this mentoring can happen anywhere. It can happen at home, at work, at play, uh, wherever. But for more ideas about how you can invest in others or what you can do in the church setting, take a look at the discipleship pathways display out there in the foyer. Or just ask Glenn or myself or Neil uh, or uh, especially Dan uh, how you can help, how you can mentor, how you can get alongside uh, other Christians. Investment reaps its rewards. So I just want to encourage you all. We all have knowledge. We all have gifts and abilities to share with new believers or young Christians. I really want to encourage you just, just to try to do one thing new or achieve something new this week. Take a practical step to act on the faith that you have. And it's not a guilt thing. It's not something I'm telling you you have to do. It's something that flows out of your love for God and what he's done for you. Let's pray to finish. Father, we, we love you because you loved us first. Uh, what a great love you've shown to us in, in, the, in the sacrifice and what you've given. You uh, teach us in your words that if we are to find our life, we are to give it away first. Help us to be bold and courageous and to, to make those connections and to find ways of giving away what we have to instruct others, to mentor them, to disciple them. Help us to take those steps, uh, knowing that you took the greatest step of all, Lord. 
We praise you for that and we thank you in Jesus' name.